because if you're getting punished, um, if you're a black student for doing something this white kid did and didn't get punished, that's a, that's a policy kind of issue, I think. But it's also a professional development issue. And, and I think it's, it's an awareness of the bias. And so we need to have, we need to really encourage all educators in our system to have an awareness of their biases and to have strategies to deal with those biases so that you don't inadvertently call on or not call on certain groups or individual students. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think something that, um, and this is a tribute to you, Dr. Hill, as well as to you, Scott, in terms of um, your ability to execute the district vision. And I think ways in which you can prevent bias is to create equitable practices that celebrate kids. So, you know, at Doherty, you know, kids get an opportunity to be, you know, when you're in the second grade, it's a tr tradition to be on the student council. Um, there are opportunities to, you know, if you're demonstrating uh, uh, good behavior, to be recommended to spend some time with the principal and do uh, some things with recess. And really what that means is everyone's going to get a chance to spend some time you know, with the principal so that they are, they are seen and they get an opportunity to be with Scott in a way that's, that's a nurturing space. But then what the teachers do that I think is really excellent is they offer all of these opportunities for students to either uh, recognize their culture with a family tree or they're uh, a student of the week where they can come in and they go through a process and talk about their family and talk about things that they really enjoy and the students affirm the things that they're doing. So these processes and practices that you can that you put in place really help to support the structures of, of uh, anti-racist practices. But when those things aren't in place and people are spending more time in individual classes winging it, it really makes it difficult for a parent to feel the, the love, the consistent love across um, across classrooms and across grades. And so because we have multiple children at Darty, we were able to see, you know, the, the alignment around expectations and the importance of relationships. And we felt the, the quality nurturing and, and particularly through COVID. And see, what I would say to people is, you know, I have friends with children in other places and, and it was all over the place in terms of engagement. And I almost felt bad sharing mine because, you know, from, uh, from each teacher calling us and checking in daily and being vulnerable around their ability to manage the Zoom platforms and Google and just sharing that. And we saw over time as they got better, we knew that they were doing everything they possibly could so that all kids could learn. And, you know, anybody who knows Ms. Lafayette, for example, if you are responding, she's gonna text you and call you. So your best bet is to respond the first time that she reached out to you because there is no ducking her. And to me, that's a, that's a level of expectation that she has, not just, you know, for the district, but of herself as an educator. So I think, you know, that, that made me feel really good as a parent, but these are all structures and practices that she was doing from the very first day of school. So I think having those policies and practices in place, and the more of those you have, it really, it really puts you in a position to, um, to not have as many blind spots available uh, for those situations of bias to take place. I really appreciate that perspective. And talking about just regular important just great instruction and it starts with the heart right it starts with connecting with families and kids as individual people um so thank you for that any closing thoughts gentlemen um before we wrap up